Hello and good afternoon. My name is Erica Wunderlich Majumder. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison in the Department of Bacteriology. And today I'm really excited to be talking about a subject that is pretty near and dear to my heart or one of my passions in science, which is thinking about how we can use microbiology and biochemistry and engineering to try to create solutions uh, to some of the environmental issues that are facing us uh, today. And so today I'm talking about turning uh, agricultural waste into usable plastic. And I think many of us are now familiar with some of the issues that we deal with with plastics. Uh, plastics are incredibly useful materials. We uh, use them in pretty much everything. If you took a look at what you're wearing today, you would probably find some type of plastic in almost everything that you have on. And there's so many uses for plastic. It's an incredibly flexible material. And so it's become ubiquitous in our experience today um, as, as humans. However, uh, that use has led to the production of hundreds of millions of tons of plastic every year globally. And ultimately, very, very little, a very small percentage of that plastic gets recycled. The vast majority of that plastic is ending up in the environment in some form or another. Oftentimes, that location is a landfill. So you can see the first two images here are actually my lab sampling our local landfill in Wisconsin. I'm taking the picture. And the first picture is from a, a site of the landfill where that trash has been underground for 40 years. And I think you can still readily identify the plastic pieces that are sitting in that environment even after 40 years. And we can see that there's a pretty good amount um, of plastic there. And in fact, our Wisconsin landfills are around 20% plastic. And then that middle picture was taken from the side of the landfill where they are actively dumping. So that trash that we're standing on was dumped there a couple hours before that picture was taken. And you can still see a lot of plastic debris just sitting there. So in the 40 years between those pieces of plastic or when that was dumped by a dump truck there, there's been no change in how much plastic is ending up in our landfills. And that's contributing to landfills filling up. Unfortunately, in a lot of places, there is not a common practice of landfilling. And so the ultimate fate of most plastics is waterways and therefore the ocean. And I think we've all heard the staggering facts about how much plastic is in the ocean. And, you know, there's gyres that are larger than European countries by size. And so that's just a scale that is hard to imagine. And so this is an issue that we would really like to change. And there's a lot of actual opportunity for uh, microbial intervention into this situation. So I'm not gonna talk about the degradation of existing plastic today, but instead offer a vision for how we can replace these plastics that are persistent in the environment. And one of the ways we can do that is by making bio-based and fully biodegradable or compostable plastics. So what do I mean by that? Bio-based means that the source material is from a plant or from a microbe and not from a fossil fuel source. And by fully biodegradable, I mean a material that will break down into its monomers. So plastics are polymers, which means they are long chains of small molecules that have been linked together. And a lot of times what we hear about is a plastic breaking down, but usually it only breaks down into the microplastic or the nanoplastic form, which is actually more toxic for the environment. And so smaller in this case is worse. So we actually need to go really small. We want plastics that can break all the way down to their monomer components. And so that way they're not causing any further uh, harm to the ecosystem. And when they're in the monomer form, then a microbe is very happy to eat that as a carbon substrate. And we can upcycle that carbon into tens of thousands of different chemicals that will be useful bioproducts towards creating a sustainable bioeconomy. But today I'm going to talk about one particular type of molecule. But first, I'll highlight the waste streams that we could take advantage of. And so the reason why we think about agricultural or forestry residues 
is because some of the limitations in the bioplastics industry right now are feedstock cost, the polymer types. So by polymer types, I mean that, you know, when we think about fossil fuel-based plastics, there's a great variety in flexibility and in tensile strength. And currently, bioplastics tend to be pretty brittle. So we need to find uh, other polymer types or engineer other polymer types that are more flexible, specifically so we can replace single-use plastics, because single-use plastics are the largest contributor to uh, landfills and to the contamination in the ocean. So we're working on feedstock cost, we're working on polymer types, and then also for any type of industry process, you know, if we're going to replace hundreds of millions of tons of new plastic every year, we need to be able to do that at a high polymer quality and a high yield. And so we actually see agricultural and forestry residue waste streams as being a viable source of these types of uh, replacements to address these issues. So agricultural waste streams are the byproducts of other typical production. So food production, um, other types of processing, paper, wood for homes, any of those types of things. All of those processes have waste streams coming off of them that still have viable carbon, but don't compete with the use of the intended product. And typically, these waste streams are a burden to their parent industry. So the industry usually has to pay to dispose of these materials, and they tend to be not environmentally friendly. So if we can uh, upcycle these to valuable products, it would be adding revenue to those industries as well and solving that type of environmental issue. And so I'm highlighting just a few potential feedstocks here just to give you some examples, but there are dozens if not hundreds that are at sufficient scale uh, to be useful for this. Uh, the top one is acid whey and whey permeate from the dairy industry. We have wood chips coming from the forestry industry, leftover food waste from inadequate food distribution. We actually have algal biomass. So if you're making a biorefinery to make biofuels, there's actually tons of algae biomass that gets left over from that. So you have algae biomass, and then you have things like corn stover, which means that is the rest of the corn plant that is not the ear of corn. So after the ear of corn has been extracted for food, you still have that entire corn stalk you know, that's taller than me. So that's a lot of biomass that's available there. And then in the middle, we have pyrolysis oil. A typical current treatment for uh, biomass is to pyrolyze or to heat it really high. And one of the byproducts you get off of that is pyrolysis oil. And so all of these are great carbon sources for microbes if we can figure out how to convert them into bioproducts. So in my lab, we collaborate with a bioprocess engineer at SUNY Environmental Science and Forestry. And with Dr. Deepak Kumar, we have been working on optimizing bioprocesses to convert different types of agricultural wastes into um, a microbial polymer that is used industrially to make bio-based and biodegradable plastics. So that polymer class is called polyhydroxyalkanoates, and many different species of microbes naturally produce this polymer as an energy storage molecule under nutrient limitation stress. And so since they naturally produce this polymer and can produce it at very high yields, so they're storing lots and lots of it, those are all the polymer inside of the cell, uh, they also naturally possess the depolymerase, or the enzyme that helps in the degradation because the microbe wants to eventually recover that molecule for energy uh, when it runs out. And so bioplastics made out of polyhydroxyalkanoates can uh, biodegrade completely and rapidly uh, within a time scale that would be sufficient to limit environmental harm. However, the main type of these polyhydroxyalkanoates is called polyhydroxybutyrate, and it is quite brittle. So it's great for applications like cutlery, but less great for things like films or other types of flexible packaging. So what we've been doing is a couple of things. We work on um, optimizing different types of waste streams, improving the metabolism of the microbes so that we can increase our yield and um, our bioproduction. And so what that starts with is we identify a waste stream where there's sufficient quantity. And then my collaborator, Dr. Kumar, uh, computes a techno-economic analysis and a life cycle assessment to see if we are making the right product from the right waste stream and 
that also gives me metrics for the microbe. So it tells me what types of conditions I need my microbe to operate in. And it also tells me what type of yield and quality parameters I need to hit with that polymer. And so then I go in and try to design the metabolism and the growth conditions of the organism while minimizing energy input to maximize the carbon use in the waste stream to get a higher yield of our target polymer. And so the example I'm showing, we recently published, we were able to take raw acid whey, which is what is left over from Greek yogurt and soft cheese production. It has a low pH, and we were able to find an E. coli that could grow. We had to raise the pH a little bit, if I'm being honest. We tried to not have to raise the pH, but we did have to raise the pH a little bit. Um, so if we minimally raised the pH and gave it just a couple of vitamins, we were able to get almost complete conversion of the lactose and lactate that are in the acid whey to polyhydroxybutyrate with upwards of 86% of the cell mass being the polymer, which was a really exciting yield. And that was straight from the raw acid whey. That wasn't from synthetic. Actually, the raw acid whey did better than our um, synthetic acid whey that we were testing first. So that was really surprising that the w raw waste feedstock um, gave us better yields. We certainly have a lot of work to do in terms of scaling this up to the industrial level, but we were really encouraged to find a waste stream where we could uh, convert all of that carbon and still attain high yields of our product. And so uh, this gives us a lot of hope that there is potential for using these different types of waste streams that are abundant and are localized and would need little transportation and using our microbial knowledge to uh, produce these bioproducts and creating that vision for a sustainable bioeconomy that will have limited environmental impacts. So thank you.